Welcome to section 33 of the viruses. This is our virus overview figure, and in this video, we will be discussing the rabies virus, which you can see right here. Our story involves a forested area in which innocent human mine workers were attacked by a devastating rabies infestation. Here's our first infected beast. It's almost universally understood that rabies causes foaming at the mouth. So when we look at this rabid beast foaming at the mouth, you should think of rabies. Next, notice all the red in the sky. Looks pretty eerie. Well, this red warm color scheme indicates that this is an RNA virus. Now there's some dark rain clouds up above as well. Dark rain clouds like this give many people those negative vibes. So these negative dark rain clouds indicate that this is a negative sense virus. As mentioned before, patients have foaming at the mouth when they have rabies. And the more technical term is hypersalivation. So this foaming at the mouth or salivating beast indicates that patients can have hypersalivation, which can be manifest as drooling or saliva dripping from the mouth. Now notice that the beast is grabbing his head in agony. This indicates the tremendous headaches that can accompany a rabies infection. So grabbing head in agony for headaches. Now look at the face of this beast. He looks like a raccoon. So this is what happened. He was bitten by an infected raccoon, so now he's a weir raccoon of sorts. This indicates that raccoons are known reservoirs for the rabies virus. So watch out for raccoons. If you are bitten by a rabid raccoon, you won't turn into a weir raccoon, but you will likely have the nasty headache and experience hypersalivation. Now look at this cave the miners were using for their work. As this weir raccoon howled at the moon, he scared the bats out of the mining caves. These bats will help you remember that bats are reservoirs for rabies. Now these miners actually live off killing and eating skunks. Hunting the skunks not only feeds the campers, but it also cuts down on the nasty smell that the skunks can cause in the area. Anyways, these skunks represent the fact that skunks are also reservoirs for rabies. So when you encounter a skunk, they may stink you up, but you should be more worried about them giving you rabies. Not totally aware of the weir raccoon infestation of their camp, these miners are busying themselves with a game of memory. They have actually written the word memory on the table to remind them of the name of the game that they're playing. Apparently, their memory isn't all that good. Now, this represents the fact that rabies can spread to the hippocampus of the brain, an area responsible for memory. So, again, playing a game of memory stands for memory loss via hippocampal damage. Now, we see that this weir raccoon is dead on the ground. He was shot in the back, as you can see with those wounds there. This represents the fact that rabies is deadly. Now, this is the man who grabbed his gun fast enough to take down the beast before it could attack those people at the table. Now, you can see the man dumping out all the shells of his gun. Look at those bullets. Those bullet shells represent the fact that the rabies virus has a bullet shape to them. This left image demonstrates the layers of the virus. You can see the envelope, the outermost membrane, takes the shape of a bullet. The right image is an electron micrograph revealing several bullet-shaped rabies virus envelopes. You can see them here. Now look closely at the wounds that those silver bullets made. It has an interesting pattern, much like a negri body. This histological image shows a negri body in a nerve cell body. So this is a nerve cell body and we can see the cytoplasm in here, and the negri bodies are these eosinophilic inclusions. So again, negri bodies are cytoplasmic inclusions found in the neuron cell body. Now look at this miner climbing up the bell tower. He is trying to warn the other people in the mining camp that they are being attacked by weir raccoons. The bell represents the cerebellum. The man, before he reaches the cerebellum bell, slips and starts to lose his balance. You can see that he's lost his footing there. This represents the fact that the cerebellum is responsible for balance. So when you see a bell and the idea of balance together like this in an image, think about the cerebellum. And in this case, the cerebellum has been infected. His buddy down below is trying to help the situation. You can see he's attached to a bungee cord. Bungee sounds like Purkinje, as in Purkinje neurons. These are the neurons within the cerebellum that get infected. This image shows the layers of the cerebellum, and it's discussed in the cerebellum section within our neurology physiology chapter. So for details, please review that. But for now, just know that the Purkinje cells form this layer here within the cerebellum. Now apparently, weir raccoons hate water. So this guy is helping out by spilling water onto one of the beasts. This represents hydrophobia, fear of water, which is a manifestation of a rabies infection. Now the reason patients are afraid of water is because swallowing triggers painful pharyngeal spasms. The infection reaching the central nervous system messes with these brainstem functions, including swallowing. So patients avoid water because it causes pain. So this rabid beast recoiling at the water stands for hydrophobia, due to pain. Now when our bell tower guy lost his balance, he spilled the bucket of water he was holding. You can see the water splash all over his head and his hat. This represents the fact that rabies leads to encephalitis. The fact that there is a hat on his head makes reference to the brain, and the fact that it's water splashing all over his head and hat indicate that this entire brain is infected. 
so encephalitis. Now to drive this point home, what parts of the brain are you likely to find Negri bodies in? The cerebellum and the hippocampus. Now look at this beast devour the seagull. We like to use seagulls to represent acetylcholine. The fact that the rabid beast is devouring the seagull represents rabies virus binding to acetylcholine receptors. Now the miners in the camp need to have dynamite around to mine appropriately. And you can see these boxes labeled dynamite. Dynamite sounds like dynein. It's the dynein motors within the nerve axons that allow the rabies virus to travel up the axon. So the virus attacks the acetylcholine receptors, then it's carried up the axon via dynein motors. So again, dynamite for dynein motors. Now look at the lamps outside each tent here. The lowest one has already burned out. The top two are still functioning appropriately. This represents the virus ascending up the axon in a retrograde fashion. So again, lowest light burning out first represents an ascending infection. So again, the rabies virus will depict here as a bullet. It attacks the acetylcholine receptor, which you can see here. Then you can see the rabies virus taken into the cell and the dynein motors carrying it up in this retrograde fashion. You can see it again here being carried by the dynein motors. Finally, they enter the cell body. In addition to those bullet-shaped envelopes, which you can see on histology, you can also see those Negri bodies. Now look at this minor guy with a gun standing right between the two trees. You can see that he was trying to save his friends, so he just shot this beast in the leg with a tranquilizer dart. You can see that the beast has dragged its leg through the ground behind him. His leg is obviously totally paralyzed. This represents the paralysis and sensation loss that can accompany a rabies infection. This makes sense because there is an ascending infection up the axon. So again, dragging, limp, paralyzed leg stands for paralysis. Did you notice that long line created by the beast dragging its limp leg? This long line represents the fact that this is a linear virus. Did you notice how all the tails on the beast are super curly, kind of like a helix? This represents the helical capsid that rabies virus has. Now this poor guy was just bitten by an infected weir raccoon. You can see him staggering about all sick-like. He's loosening his collar because he's getting hot. The point is that he feels super sick and he has a fever and malaise. This represents the fever and malaise that patients often experience. This occurs early in the disease. And since it occurs early, we made this guy just recently bitten. See, he's not yet transformed into a beast. That's how you know it's early in the disease. So again, sick human for malaise and fever early in the disease. Now look at this beast crushing a medicine box beneath his foot. He is super angry that his friend got shot with one of those darts, so he proactively smashed this thing to bits. You can see all the broken vaccine syringes falling out of the box. These broken vaccine needles represent the fact that patients should be treated with a killed vaccine. Once bitten, patients should be given a killed vaccine. The miners need to do their laundry up here in the forest, so they have their clotheslines here. These clothespins look kind of like little antibodies. These antibody clothespins are obviously far behind the weir raccoon that killed those vaccines. Nevertheless, they are directly above the monster's head in the image. So the proximity between the clothespins and the syringes below should help you remember that these two items should be given together. The patient should be given rabies immunoglobulins, antibodies, along with the killed vaccine. Now that we've covered the image, let's do a question to apply what you've learned. A 43-year-old male was bitten on the right hand by a bat while cleaning out his cabin in a forested area. Several months later, he died and an autopsy was performed. An electron micrograph of the cerebellum was taken following dissection of the patient's brain, which is shown below. Which of the following is most likely true regarding the deceased patient's condition? A. The patient did not experience fever and malaise early in the disease. B. He experienced numbness in his right hand during his illness. C. Rabies immunoglobulin and live rabies vaccine should have been administered soon after the bite. Or D. The patient avoided water due to perceiving a bitter taste. Now hopefully you could tell that this patient had rabies from the electron micrograph, which shows the bullet-shaped envelopes of the rabies virus. Also, the patient was bitten by a bat, which is a known reservoir for rabies. Plus, the histological sample was taken from the cerebellum a location in the CNS known to house the rabies virus. With that in mind, the correct answer is B. He experienced numbness in his right hand during his illness. Recall that the virus can travel up axons in a retrograde manner. This can ultimately mess with the sensation or the motor function of the patient. Recall the beast back here with the tranquilizer dart in its leg. This represents the sensation loss or numbness as well as loss of motor function. And the beast attacking the seagulls represents attaching to the acetylcholine receptors and then the dynamite represents traveling up the dynein motors of the axon. Now choice A is wrong because patients do experience fever and malaise earlier in their illness. Choice C is wrong because patients should receive a killed vaccine, not a live one. Otherwise, this choice would have been true. And choice D is wrong because patients experience hydrophobia due to painful pharyngeal spasms, not a better taste. And that's all you need to know about the rabies virus.